Mark here from Talking Bass. This week we're going to look at something a little different. We're going to look at the massive sound of the 12-string bass and how you can use a couple of basic pedals to get a rough approximation of the tone with a regular four-string. As a song example, we're going to look at the Pearl Jam classic, Jeremy, which features probably the most famous 12-string riff of all time. As always, the lesson material is all there over at Talking Bass. Just click the link in the card or in the info below and you'll be able to play along to the backing tracks with the supplied tab. Then, while you're there, remember to check out over 500 extra free bass lessons in the lesson map and sign up to the free membership to gain access to a ton of free practice resources, ebook downloads, a complete social network, and much more. Like I said, it's all free, and there's a great community of over 120,000 other bass players if you want to ask any questions, so go check it out. So, what is a 12-string bass? Well, it's pretty much the same as a four-string bass, but for each of the four strings, we have two extra light-gauge sympathetic strings tuned an octave higher than the regular string. So four times three equals 12. You play it like a regular four string, but those extra octave strings add a beautiful sparkle and chime to the tone. So think 12 string guitar, that's the same effect, but for bass. Also, the fact that it's got two sympathetic octave strings helps in competing with the overwhelming power of the main bass strings, and that tiny deviation in tune in between them adds a cool chorus-like effect for each individual note. 12-string basses are more popular than you might think. Tom Peterson of Cheap Trick is one of the most famous 12-string players, Doug Pinnock of King's X is another, John Paul Jones occasionally dabbled with a 12, and today we're going to look at Jeff Arment's famous 12-string playing with Pearl Jam. The most obvious example of a 12-string bass in rock history is undoubtedly Jeremy from the album 10. Jeremy was a big hit, and Jeff plays a complete solo intro with his Hamer 12-string. But before we get to Jeremy, let's look at how we might go about getting that huge 12-string tone. Well, the first and most obvious way is to buy a 12-string bass. There are quite a few 12-string brands out there like Schecter, Dean, Hamer, and Musicvox, but they're not the cheapest basses in the world, and they're not that easy to find in music stores, so you might need to resort to buying them online without testing them first. But today, let's have a look at a simple effects hack that you can use for creating a rough estimation of that 12-string sound. To do this, I'm going to use a POG octave pedal, just like the one that I used in the Royal Blood video. And I'm going to also use a distortion pedal, in this case a Dark Glass Alpha Omega pedal, but any overdrive or fuzz pedal should be fine. For all of these examples, I'll be using a pick like most of the 12-string players do. This is going to give us a nice attack and better clarity for each note. So, in terms of effects, I'm going to set the dry signal of the POG to full, and then raise the one octave up level to about 90% which gives us this kind of sound. Now, that's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Pogs are digital effects that typically give a very synthy, unnatural octave sound, but they do track perfectly, so that's our Pog sound. Next, I'm going to set the distortion pedal so that we get a fairly subtle crunch. We don't want flat-out distortion, we just want enough warm overdrive to sweeten the Pog's digital tone. So, here's the totally clean sound with no effects. with the crunch. And now with the pog as well. So you can hear that. You can hear that sparkle on the top with that octave. Now, this obviously isn't going to sound exactly the same as a 12-string bass, but it does give us a huge, beefy, grinding tone with the same 12-string octave vibe. We're missing the sound of the three pick attacks for each string, and the POG octave is still going to sound a little digital. But by playing with plenty of attack and adjusting the picking position to accommodate certain required tones, it can sound absolutely... <laughs> huge. And another cool thing about the POG is that chords can also sound pretty nice. So, now on to Jeremy. Let's look at the intro, which sounds like this.
So we're in the key of A and we start with an open A string. Then we have D to E, 5th fret to the 7th fret on the A string, and we play the D and we hammer on to the E. Then we play the open A string again, so... So that's the start. Then we play the A at the 7th fret of the D string. Then back to the open A string, then to the G at the 5th fret of the D string. Next, we hold that G and we play these two harmonics. Now the pitches there are a D and a G, but all you have to think of is we're just playing the harmonic at the 7th fret and the 5th fret. So if you've never played harmonics before, which I'm guessing most of you have, you just hold the finger lightly against the string right over the frets there. So it's right over the 7th fret. You hold it lightly, you pick, and then you can move the hand off. So same on the 5th fret. So it's 7th fret and 5th fret. And remember, you want to you wanna, uh, fret those right over the fret, not in between, because we've got different nodes in between there. So it's right over the fret. So... So I'm keeping that first finger held down there for the G and just playing those two harmonics there with the fourth finger and second finger. Next, we repeat that line. But this time, the harmonics are going to be seventh fret of the G string and then fifth fret of the A string. Then we just repeat the first line. And then, and then we have, just play on that G and the fifth fret of the uh, D string until we come in with the full riff. So, a little bit of a technical tip here. I'm actually going to be bringing the thumb round slightly to, to mute the E string, okay? We're going to be trying to hold down a lot of uh, noise here. So, I'm, I've got the thumb there, roughly just against the E string, then... I'm using the first and third fingers to hammer on on the fifth to seventh, uh, seventh frets. Then when I go to fret the seventh fret there on the D string, I'm using the second finger to rest lightly against the A string to mute that. So because we don't want we don't want a full chord, uh, we don't want that open A ringing out. So then we play the open A again, and then when I fret the G there with the first finger, I'm using the second and third fingers to, I'm just holding them in place there, um, resting lightly against the A string again to cut it off. Okay, so as we use the third and first fingers for the fretting on the D string, I'm using the other fingers there to mute that A string. Because if you hold that, if you hold that open A while you're playing that G, you get this. You know, this dissonance. Okay? For the picking hand, you can use alternate picking or all down strokes. If you use all down strokes, it's fine. Or alternate, it's fine also. The only thing I would say in terms of the picking hand is pay attention to the position of the hand. So I'm picking fairly close to the middle between the neck and the uh, and the uh, bridge there to get a nice beefy tone there. But then when I go for the harmonics, I pick further towards the bridge because it's, you're just going to get more uh, more mids there. out a lot better. So here's that whole opening again. tried the intro you can try the verse riff which is very similar which with drums sounds like this mm -hmm. 
So this riff starts out exactly the same as the intro. But then we immediately go into a variation. So we play the same thing, but jump straight back down to the open A and just fitting in another one of those little hammer-ons before we play the G, okay, which you can see all written out there in the sheet music and tab, so. Same. Different, okay, so that's the second bar. And then for the next part we have. Okay, so instead of playing the G there, Instead of that G, the fifth fret of the D string, we're playing this, this chord, this A major chord. So we've got C sharp up on the top on the G string, that's at the sixth fret. We've got the A at the seventh fret of the D string, and we're playing the open A as well. So that's that nice A major chord. Okay, so. So there, when I play that, I play just as I did before, but then when we move to onto that chord, I'm actually using an upstroke. You can use a downstroke, but I just find it's, uh, we get a lot more chime from the chord, and more definition there in those upper notes, if you use an upstroke, so. And then we just repeat that second bar again. So all of that together, slowly. So that's the whole of that riff, and we would just repeat it. So again, let's try that with the track. The second part of the verse, where we have the daddy bit, <laughs> sounds like this. So here we've got some more chords. We start with the original hook, and then we have our A major chord that we played in the previous riff. So we've got the A and the C sharp up on the top. So open A string, seventh fret of the D string, and sixth fret of the G string. Okay, so. Then we play again two and. So we play the open A string and then chord, so. And that's the whole of that bar. Then we just play it for the whole of the, pretty much most of the second bar, just with the single chord, again, preempting it with the open A, so. Two, three, and then we've got that little hook again. Next we have a repeat of the same rhythm, but this time we start with an A sus4, so this is going to be seventh fret on the D and the G strings, so we've taken that sixth fret, the C sharp, up to the seventh fret, so. And then we move back down to the A major, so that good old sus4 to major chord, so. Okay, and then the same again in the second uh, of those bars, so. So let's have a listen to that with the verse drums. Now, just a quick word on the technique here. When you play the A major chord there, we are using the second and first fingers there, so 
second finger takes the D string and first finger takes the G string. But then when I play the sus4 chord, where we're playing both of the seventh frets there, I'm using the second and third fingers for the D and G string, and then just raising that third finger and using the first finger when we drop down to the C sharp. Okay, so. And then. Next up, let's have a look at the chorus riff, which sounds like this. So here we start with two eighth notes. A, 7th fret of the D string, down to the F at the 8th fret of the A string. Then we play it again and drop down to the D, 5th fret of the uh, A string, and then come up. E, 7th fret, F, 8th fret again, so. 3, 4, 1, 2, and 3, 4. Okay, so we've got 1, 2, and 3, 4 in terms of the timing. 1, 2, and 3, 4. Then we're on to the open A again. One, two, and three, four. Okay, so again on the end of two. One, two, and three, four. Open A and then the seventh fret at, on the D string. Then we've got the little hook again. Repeat. Then instead of moving up to the F at the eighth fret of the A string, we drop down to the C at the third fret of the A string, so. With this riff, because we've got quite a bit of space in there with the individual notes, you really get to hear that big grinding tone. You know, you can really hear that tone in there. So let's have another listen with the track. As one last example, we also have the heavy outro riff that sounds great with this setup, and it sounds like this. So all we're doing here is working through the chord progression of F, G, and then A. So first fret and third fret on the E string. So I'm just playing eighth notes there, and then open A string, and I'm alternating with these octaves at the seventh fret of the D string. So. And he plays around with the actual rhythm here, so he doesn't always play straight eighth notes. You know, sometimes we have. And the rhythm there in that A bar. And like I said, <laughs> this sound is really good for this because we're on those low strings and we don't really have to deal with all that syn uh, you know that synthesized you know that poggy sound down here it just sounds like that big grinding tone so like i said this setup is only a hack for getting that 12 string vibe it's no replacement for the real thing but Aside from the 12 string emulation, this combination of pog and fuzz might be just the ticket for when you want a big fat grinding bass tone with both treble and low end. 
playing on that E and A string is always going to sound great. You just need to be careful on the higher strings if you want to avoid all that overly digital pog sound. So please like the video, subscribe and hit the bell to get notifications on new vids every Friday and check out the lesson material and drum tracks over at the website by clicking the link in the info below. There are over 500 extra free bass lessons there in the lesson map and you can also subscribe to the free membership to gain access to a huge amount of free practice resources, downloads and forums. There's a thriving community of over 120,000 members signed up already, so plenty of people to help out with any questions that you might have. So get on over to Talking Bass and I'll see you next week.